Coming up on today's Locked On Senators, are we any closer to an Alex Dabrinka trade? And is Vladimir Tarasenko waiting to sign? And we have our second of our Dev Camp interviews to show you guys. It's recurring guest. We have some good laughs with Belleville's head coach, David Bell. That's all coming up on today's edition of the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Welcome inside episode 836 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan, back in the nation's capital in Ottawa, Ontario, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains. Today is Thursday, July 6th. Please like and subscribe to the show on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Pilsy, Vladimir Tarasenko has changed agents after we heard two days ago that he was close to signing. Yeah, that's always an interesting little plot twist, Ross, when a, a player is trying to get a deal done and things aren't working and it's taking longer than they like and boom, you go for the agent change and the agents that he's with now, Ross, very, very well known, Pat Brisson. And oh, uh, Didn't we just talk about Pat Brisson? We did, we did. There's some Senators connections, which is always good. Of course, Claude Giroux. Uh, it uses Pat Prisona as an agent, and I believe Jake Sanderson uh, does as well. Correct. Yeah, so Pierre Dorian, it, I think he only needs to know, like, what, three or four agents uh, to get all the deals he needs to do done, apparently, but uh, that's definitely a good thing for the Ottawa Senators, I would say. One thing that uh, is to note about this is uh, J.P. Barry, who's his other agent, so he's got two of them there working for him, and, and it's that they believe he's a top line player. What else are they going to say? Right. This is a guy who just watched his countryman and a guy his age, Dmitry Orlov, just signed a two year deal for $7.5 million. Right. So now he's looking at the market and there's a lot of spots already filled. And then there's Ottawa, who has a sniper who might need replacing. And maybe the deals that are coming in right now from a team like Anaheim, a team like Detroit, are more futures based. So could Ottawa give Tarasenko the best deal? And Pilsy, do you think this is actually a fit between the player and the team? I think it is a fit if and when Alex Dabrinkit is no longer a part of the team because they're going to need uh, kind of an elite goal scorer to fill that role that's going to be left by Alex Dabrinkit. And they're going to need a top six forward or at the very least a middle six forward. And I think with Tarasenko... I'm not so convinced he's still a top line guy anymore. I mean, he's getting a little bit older. He has had some injury concerns. He's 31, but uh, his latest injury was a broken hand that he suffered last season blocking a Matt Dumba shot. So that definitely is something that teams might be concerned about. And I believe he had shoulder uh, issues in the past as well. So for an older sniper, hand and shoulder issues aren't uh, ideal. That's for sure. But I think for Vladimir Tarasenko, Anything in the five to seven million dollar range seems like an appropriate spot for him. I wouldn't disagree about that, Pilsy, but what I would say is Ottawa can't be going with term for Vladimir Tarasenko. No. And that's where I think they might lose out in a bidding war. But on the contrary, Pierre Dorian had no issue giving Corpusallo five years. So maybe, and I know he's a bit younger, maybe two or three years younger, but I think Tarasenko could probably command a three, four-year deal. No? Well, it's interesting, Ross, because like you mentioned, Tarasenko and his ex-agent, current agent, I don't, I don't know, but are probably looking around the atmosphere and saying, hey, we got a 30, uh, early 30s, 30 goal scorer here that's available, and there's no room left. There's no slices of the pie left for him to take. So I actually think, Ross, we might see the opposite happen. We might see Vladimir Tarasenko go for a short-term deal just to just to get somewhere and playing hockey, making money, and then hope that next time uh, free agency rolls around for him, the cap is increased and there's more pieces of the pie that he can eat up there. 
Well, so that's just the thing. Do you try to bank on the fact, and the rumor is it might go up $4 million next year to the salary cap, whereas yeah. it went up $1 million this year. All of a sudden, everybody's eating a little bit more. Do you want to just kind of reset and go into that market? And if so, then you really are just looking for the best opportunity that you have to score big. That's what Tyler Bertuzzi did by going to Toronto. He expects to be on a top two line there, crank the production, cash in next year. Max Domi did the same thing. Even Orlov on a two-year deal as one of the most noteworthy free agents. Usually those guys lock up all the term, but it seems like there's been a bit of a shift. Now, there have still been some long-term deals handed out, just like the New York Islanders, the long-term deal special, although they were just keeping their own guys yeah. for seven, eight years going forward. But it just seems like there's been a bit of a shift. And with that, could we see Tarasenko sign in Ottawa, let's say, one year, $6 million. One year, $6.5 million. I would have, as long as they get Pinto done, as long as they're not, like, within dollars of the cap. So we see a lineup dressed without a, without a forward or without a defenseman, like we've seen Toronto and Vegas have to do over the years or get the ATO out for a backup goalie, that sort yeah. of thing. Let's leave a little bit of breathing room here. But beyond that, if this is going to be a cap team, figure out what you're paying Pinto and just chuck the rest at the guy who you think is going to replace the cat. That's going to get you as close to the cap as possible for this upcoming season. No, I'm with you, and I think that's why I would work with Tarasenko. Uh, ideally, Ross, you get him on a two-year deal. I think still the one-year uh, isn't great for Ottawa, but, I mean, it's a free agent, so it doesn't cost you any assets. It just costs you cap room to do. So if that's something he's interested in, I would definitely look at that. And, look, Vladimir Tarasenko is still a top-notch player. Like, he, he's someone that, if he can stay healthy for, for a full season, Ross, I think... 30 goals is the floor. He scored a one-handed goal against Ottawa in March. Like yes. he, he, He's not washed at all. He can still play. But uh, defensively, he's even – he's not that – I'd say he's better than Dabrinkit defensively. <laughs> I mean, Ross, I'm looking at his plus-minus here. And again, classic caveat, plus-minus isn't the all-end-all. But he finished the season as a minus 14, so not great. Oh, he's twice as good as Dabrinkit. Alex Dabrinkit was a minus 31. So – yeah, um, I, I, but here's the thing. Do you think, obviously, scoring goals is great, Ross, but do you think he would be a fit? Because one thing that kind of hinders me a little bit from Vladimir Tarasenko is, would he be a guy that catches the DJ Smith doghouse? Mm, I would hope not. Because DJ is a guy that likes players that play with pace, play with physicality, and... He's, he's a bit more physical than I think he gets credit for. Yeah, okay. Well, may, maybe. I mean, so, like, hits are tough because depending on what building you are, like, you kind of have to see the player. But I think he's a strong player, that's for sure. I think I think DJ would appreciate him for sure. Yeah, I mean, actually looking at his dimensions here, Ross, I didn't realize this. Six feet, 225 pounds. Like, I believe it. That's, that's a lot bigger, like beefier than I thought he was going to be. So... Yeah, maybe you're right. And I mean, like, I, I only see Vladimir Tarasenko when the Blues come to town and then when, when he was with the Rangers. So I don't have a full kind of scouting report on him other than just casually. So that's interesting. Well, he got tra – so funny caveat, and to bring it back to the Sens, the draft yeah. pick that became Tarasenko was traded from Ottawa on draft night. I was at prom that night, and I get the, the message come across, the Senators – aren't going to make their pick at 16th overall in 2010. They're actually going to trade it for David Runblad, who was the first round pick 15th overall the year before. So kind of funny how they're just like, you know what? We'll punt that pick. And, and we like this Russian kid. And it turned out well. He was a part of that Russian world junior team that came back against Canada. I think they were down four, five, one, that sort of thing. Dave Cameron was the coach for, for Canada. Jared Cowan was on that team. Nice. Um, yeah, not great memories at the world juniors for Canada there. But when you look at the fit one year, all good. He comes in, scores goals, hired gun, but I don't think that I have any attachment uh, turning 33 this season or sorry. Yeah. Turning 32 this season yes. uh, in December that I would want him on a long-term deal. Cause I do think the guys in the system, the Yarventis, the Sokolovs, the Crookshanks, maybe lesser the Crookshank, maybe the first two guys I mentioned could have the potential to be goal scorers. And you don't want that to be hindered. And you want that money freed up 
for others. So let us know in the comments what you think. We're going to get to Alex DeBrinket afterwards. Obviously, every day, the Frank Cervellis of the world, the Elliot Friedmans, everyone's got the new scoop. Where is it going to go? Is it Anaheim? Is it the Islanders? Is it the Detroit Red Wings still kicking around? But nobody seemingly wants to meet his Timo Meyer like demands, which would be an eight by eight point eight contract. Lots of crazy eights flying around there, and crazy deal that would be. A big bet for Alex to bring it on that one. But first, Pilsy, what do you say we get to David Bell because this interview is hilarious? Yeah, it's all time. But before before we move on, I want to pose one more question to you, Ross. Uh, speaking of Tarasenko fit, if he does sign with Ottawa, where does he play? Where yeah, do you put him? That, that's the problem because I think naturally his best fit is with Timmy, but I'm still I'm still locked in on that top line. But the thing is, and I think someone mentioned to this, I forget if it was on YouTube or Twitter, but maybe you do consider uh, not having Giroux in pen on that top line and you put him on the uh, – wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm not talking about putting him on the third line, come on, like some people have. I'm talking about putting him on the second line just so that – he can help Josh Norris take face-offs. Norris with the shoulder. I don't know if I want him taking hundreds of face-offs uh, a year. So maybe you put Tarasenko on that top line, Giroux on the second line, so that Giroux can help out with the face-offs. How do you think about that? Well, then what? Batherson on the third line? No, I think, well, They're yeah, all right wing. That's the thing. Like, can Batherson play on the left side? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd rather not even. That's you, want, thing. you want him as more of a pass first winger to be on his strong side, so he's got better vision in the offensive zone. Yeah. So yeah. this is the thing, like Tarasenko, you're like in just on his own is like, yeah, yeah, that's a fit. But then you start being like, wait, where would he actually go? Elliot Freeman on the NHL Network says San Jose has interest in Tarasenko. I've heard at times that Nashville did. I think also Ottawa once the Brinka trade comes down, they had some interest, but I don't think Tarasenko has found the market to be what he wants. Yeah. And I don't think that's going to change. So we'll keep our eye on Tarasenko. Pilsy, what was your favorite part of the David Bell interview? Or should we just let the people decide? I'll just give a general answer here. I mean, David Bell is just such a beauty. Like, that's the best way to describe it. Like, he, that is a hockey guy through and through. Like, Ross, as soon as he walks uh, into the room to meet us, he's chirping us. Like, he, he's, we're having laughs. Like, just... Your classic hockey guy, the lingo, the the mannerisms, like it's it's clear that this guy has been around the game a lot and he kind of knows how to how to hang with the hockey guys. And I mean, self-deprecating is a safe way to describe him as well. So uh, the the Brian McGratton story is all time. We'll leave you with that. That's next. You're listening to Locked on Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. It is the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. And for a good reason, they have the best sportsbook app out there. It's safe, simple, easy to use, secure. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. Those green numbers popping up right away. And you can take your first swing at MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. So, Math guy, 20 bucks in, you'll land $200 in bonus bets. And here's the best part, win or lose. So there's no better place to bet on the MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So sign up today, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official partner of the Major League Baseball. Today's episode is also brought to you by Shawarma Palace. I literally have leftovers in the fridge right now. I always do when I'm in Ottawa because I can't stay away from Shawarma Palace. Pilsy, tell the people how delicious it was at 12.30 a.m. Eastern time the other night. And Ross, it was it was so delicious. Uh, we were coming back uh, from a good night out on the town. We were watching Shorzy late at night, and I was just – munching on my chicken shawarma wrap in all my nice dress clothes and little did i know i was dripping garlic sauce all over myself i didn't realize till after i was just so content with eating my um my chicken sandwich that i didn't even care i was like ah whatever worth it so good hey you gotta share share your shawarma palace Absolutely. Get the batter, extra garlic or just get the wrap as well, the sandwich, as we like to call it affectionately, at Shawarma Palace. It's fresh, it's fuel, it's so 
oh my god the size the portion it's literally eye popping i went to the location on bank street by gladstone the other day we ordered on uber eats uh the other night um we raced it home from from McLaren's. Who could who, who would get home first? Uh, we took our shot there, and uh, we we made it just in time. Waiting on the doorstep. You're never too far away from a shawarma palace. Great sponsor. Love hockey. Um, they are absolute beauties. Abbas and, and the whole team at Shawarma Palace do a great job. They're the only place to go for, in Ottawa for Shawarma since 1997. Come on. These guys have, have obviously done something right. So go try it today. Try Shawarma Palace. If, you, if you've already tried it, go back today because there's no better way to be fuel-filled than at Shawarma Palace. So go check them out. Shawarma Palace. We love our friends at Shawarma Palace. All right. Now here's our interview. With Belleville Senators head coach, here is David Bell. All right, we're now very pleased to welcome a friend of the show now, recurring guest, two-time guest, the head coach of the Belleville Senators, David Bell. David, how's the summer going so far? It's going well. It's going busy, busy with the kids, busy with baseball, busy with uh, rookie camp, but uh, it's going good. No complaints. Are you a full-time resident of the Bay of Quinty now? Yes, I am. It's I love it. It's awesome in the summer. Uh, great beaches. Go out to the county. Uh, stay in Belleville. Love it there. Yeah, now we got to see uh, a bunch of new AHL signings. Uh, I, I was just curious, do you have uh, any input uh, when you're talking to uh, Ryan Bonus or Pierre Dorian when they're looking for AHL guys like, hey, here's what we're looking for, here's some guys that might work, or how does that relationship work with you? Yeah, I mean, we identify them as a group. They obviously, we have school scouts that identify a group, and then everybody puts their own individual list together. Okay. And then uh, when we decided if targeted – Certain players, like all phone around, uh, just other coaches, other players who play in the league, but self, Ben Sexton, and just just to get the character checks and references on guys. Like everybody can watch them at the talent level, but yep. you want to bring good people in with with good backgrounds and good uh, leadership in the room. So that's kind of where where my role is. I think Ryan and Pierre and the staff identify these guys, and then I'll uh, do some background checks on them. So I think we're going to get to dev camp. Obviously, we're at dev camp. You were able to watch the guys skate yesterday. We're still early. It's day two. But about the guys who've already been added, you were telling us it's not the first time you've coached Boko Imama. Is he one of the guys who you had high on your list when you put it in uh, for Ryan? Well, let's just say I would rather him on my team than not. Uh, but, yeah, I had him for two years in uh, in Ontario with the LA's organization. And uh, what I just said, you talk about great people and a classy guy and loved by his teammates and hard worker and courteous to the staff and the trainers. And like he came in today and, and was here and he, I think he shook everybody's hand in the building, the bus, the drivers that drive the kids back and forth, everybody. He stopped by here and put his head in and was yeah. saying, what's up? Like we'd gone to school with him for 20 years. He, yeah, He is a good person, but also a, a mean a mean person when he when he puts the skates on flip so switches he, he's i mean i think he's you know he's gonna obviously try to push to make ottawa but if he falls down to belleville then i'm a happy guy would he be more like a scott sabrin type role where you're not going to be afraid to put him in some offensive situations too i mean savvy it was 15 goals last year for you well, guys Boko scored 44 his last year in junior so he knows yeah. how to put the puck in the net he's got a great shot he's got a great release he's a great skater he can get in on or check in a hurry. He's not a, a lumbering, slow, tough guy. Like he can move, he can get around the ice. So yeah, he'll uh, he'll get all the opportunity that you know he's got to earn it. He's got to play well. He's got to play uh, responsibly. But uh, he can put the puck in the net. Now you're heading into this season as the official head coach of the Belleville Senators. How does how does your preparation change in the off season now that uh, you you at least are, are settled in and know your place? Well, it's just uh, just the little things. Like systematically, we'll follow. Uh, Ottawa a lot closer than we had in the past so that that's something uh you just feel off a of DJ and follow that but just the off ice stuff and maybe the daily routines that I want to implement as far as even the times we, we practice the times we travel uh what we're doing at uh, team building stuff like that's more the change in my stamp of things that we're doing uh workout regiments is obviously work with the, the strength and conditioning guys but you know, every coach has their own idiosyncrasies of what they like and don't like. So now last year taking over, you just kind of don't rock the boat, and just follow along what we did and what was working. Now there's a little bit of retooling in, in those areas, the travel schedules, the practice day-to-day -day schedules, and that, that'll be more my stamp. How nice it'll be to have a healthy lineup on opening night. 
Well, it's not opening night yet. There's still a couple <laughs> training camps to go through. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey, I noticed you went out and got a lot of centermen for, for Belleville in particular. And last year we saw it was a point of emphasis where guys were coming up. And you had Roby Arventi. You told us that a lot of his move to center was based on need. Is it fair to say he's going to start on the wing again next season yeah. if he's back yeah. with you? Yeah, he's, uh, he's going to be a winger because ultimately, you know, our job is to get these guys ready for here and – here they have him pegged as a winger with the with the strength they have up the middle here as well. So he needs to grow his game as a winger and get better in areas on the on the wall. So he'll go back on the wing if, like you said, if he, he ends up with Belvo and uh, will continue to grow his game. Who's uh, one player you're kind of looking at this year to take a big step uh, with the team? Well, I hope all those guys that are they're just coming back in their third and fourth years. Like typically, those guys do. I, I don't want to put anybody under pressure to have, have that big year yep. uh, to say names, but a guy, I will say one name because he had a great year two years ago and then fell off a little bit this year in Cole Reinhardt. And yep. I think, you know, he's in a point now in his career where, okay, now take a step, take a step and be good. And he has the ability. He showed flashes. I thought his game was really, really good uh, at a point last year. Then he got hurt. Right. And he had to start all over again. So if he comes in healthy, I think he can make that, you know, you see those guys have that jump where they figure it out. I think he's ready to figure it out. And it's crazy. He's already going into his third or fourth year as, as a pro. And meanwhile, Tyler Clevin, same draft class, but he's just getting his feet wet in pro. Is he a guy you hope as an old hard-nosed defenseman yourself that you might get a chance to mold down in Belleville? Well, I mean, I don't like to, to talk about guys in Belleville. Like I've purposely not had a lot of conversations with Tyler because his focus and rightfully so should be on playing in, uh, in Ottawa. So when the American League coach comes around, it's like the Grim Reaper. Nobody wants to talk to him. You're not going to be my coach. And I get it, so I don't. I don't go have that awkward conversations. I let them do their thing. I let them have their complete focus on Ottawa. And then when and if they get the news, then, you know, we'll have conversations. But until then, I let everybody – plan on and have the mindset all summer that they're going to make the Ottawa Senators. So guys are ducking you in the hallways. Oh, it's, oh, like, it's uh, like quick, quick, check yeah, the phone. I'm uh, the principal. Yeah. <laughs> like they're diving into bathrooms <laughs> on the fake phone calls. It's everything. And it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. No matter what, uh, whether we talk about Belleville or Ottawa, it's great to see. I think this graduating class from junior is really exciting. Tyler Boucher, Zach, Stabchuk, are they some of the guys when you're up in the bird's nest up top of the Sensplex, you're watching those guys a little closer. Oh yeah. And they, and they stick out because I mean, this is their second development camp so they know what's going on they've been around actually spend some time here with with the trainers here and they also they're they're just more comfortable so they, they they stick out because you know a lot of guys are here for the first time eyes wide open they're checking out the dressing room checking out you know some of the nhl guys are walking around like claude drew was in the gym this morning and you just see some of them just gazing over probably wanting an autograph because they've not been around these guys but we're we're, we're bush and uh, zach they they've been around them and they work out with them in the summer so there's just a comfort level for who should be trying to fight him at summer skates? <laughs> yeah, well, not. I don't think that would go well with Pierre. Yeah. That, <laughs> uh, now, final question for me. Uh, you've been in the organization for a while now. Does this year feel different? Like, is there a different energy going on? A lot of the fans, uh, there's a lot of excitement and hype going into the season. In the organization, are are things a little bit different this time around? Well, it's, it's probably, you know, I mean, obviously the new ownership thing. Puts, yeah, puts a fresh start on stuff, which is which is amazing. But also our office, our business side and our office staff, you know, when COVID hit everybody, you know, the, the, the office staff was decimated down to three people. Now Brianne has, has built that staff back up and they're doing more stuff in the community and they're bringing more people into the building. Yeah. So I just think it's going to be more back to normal. And I hate because that, that word was so overused in, in COVID, but like it's nice to have – things in place going into a season that we haven't had for a few yep. years, whether it's community skates or community visits and, and more people coming into the building and having interaction. So for that, I, I'm super excited. And there's a different feel just because it's getting, it's, it's up and running now. It's up and running full steam. ahead. Well, you know, we have a soft spot for Belleville being uh, on the production team a couple of years, yeah. you know, making it easy for you in the video room. I yeah, bet. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. making it real easy. That, yeah. <laughs> but Hey, when we talk about this new crop that you're discussing now, um, we need to get that story out of you from the meeting. Cause I know a lot of our listeners, old school guys love Brian McGrath. And you said none of the kids this morning knew who he was. Well, you know, we were broken off into three groups. So my group finished a little bit early and uh, I asked them where they were going next. So they were going to, to see Brian. And I said, you guys, you guys know who he was. One or two guys out of 15 put their arm up. So 
I, uh, I had the video guy pull up some YouTube of Ryan and a couple of his more uh, spirited, spirited. Yeah. Affairs. <laughs> That's a good word. So there was some draw, the, some some big bug eyes, some jaws dropped, and uh, I stopped it after two because I didn't want them to get overly scared. Yep. Gave them time to go call mom and dad and, and regroup, <laughs> and maybe if they needed to go get a new pair of uh, shorts on and go. Not, I said, don't be late for that that guy's meeting. You didn't show him. He had 550 penalty minutes one year. No, no, <laughs> that too was enough to set the tone. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, David, really appreciate. It. We'll be in touch with you throughout the season. If that's actually no, he's a recurring guest. You have to come on whenever we ask. Now, okay, I'm I'm available. I'm okay, available awesome. and then when you hit ten times, then we get to be your do assistant get, coaches a for a day. We got some merch for you. Yeah, we got a merch store set up. We'll get you hooked up. Right, we good. did, except yeah. two of your players. We sent merch to last year, and they just didn't wear it. You know, it comes out of our pocket. We'll get the expense report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. off camera. We're not going to sue them. We're not going to sue them. David, really appreciate it. Have a great summer, and we'll see you again next season. Yep, awesome. Stick taps to Coach Bell for joining us. Fantastic conversation. Had a few laughs with him there at the end. And, Pelsey, I don't think he's going to let us on the bench in Belleville like we so requested. But um, one of the one of the good guys in the game there, David Bell, and that Brian McGratton story, when he he started telling us that off camera, he's like, he's like, do you know that nobody here knows who Brian McGratton is? And I personally felt pretty old when he said that. How about you? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're at that age, Ross, where, like, obviously we're not, like, old, old, but we're much older than these prospects now, like, a, like pretty much a decade older. So we're starting to have some of those moments where it's like, this guy's an absolute legend. What do you mean you never heard of him? Like, uh, so, yes, that was one of those moments. Could you imagine going into a seminar not knowing who Brian McGratton is? I feel like that guy just – but then he comes in and he's going to talk to you guys about, like, how to how to grind it through. Like, I'd be pulling up his hockey DB. Who is this guy? 550 penalty minutes in Binghamton? How? How did he do that? How? 551 penalty minutes for Brian McGratton. Uh. Uh, obviously you heard coach Bell say he gave the boys a minute before going in with them to call their parents. Oh, that was, that was awesome. Uh, thank you to the Sens PR staff. And we got more coming where that, where that came from and shout out to Laleem's Martian who edited that together for us. Our the guy. two camera setup was so key. We're able to make that happen with uh, Martian uh, holding the camcorder. That's Martian view right there. <laughs> um, let's get our boy to 10 K by the way. So if you're yes. on Twitter right now, Go throw the Martian a follow. Need that for you well, as well. Ross, we need to get him to 10K so that uh, Martian Palooza can happen uh, in October. Definitely check out uh, the Leaves Martian Twitter for all the updates on Martian Palooza. What a time that's going to be. Oh, it's going to be awesome. We'll find the best venue going, and maybe we can even get a sponsorship <laughs> deal out of it from the venue. Hey, Cut a little slice for the boys, too. There we go. Um, so, with all that said, more interviews from Dev Camp coming. We might do it every Friday or just something like that because we are going down to five episodes per week starting. Three. <laughs> We're already at five episodes a week. <laughs> going down to five episodes a week. Oh, boy. That's pretty much what we do, though. That's what so, we do. We posted 90 videos in June with all the draft pro. It is funny. Uh, going down to three episodes starting next week, maybe the week after. We'll see what happens with Alex to bring it. But uh, with that, we are going to have interviews with Philip Nordberg with Oscar Pedersen together, Tyler Clevin, yep. Tyler Boucher, Hoyt Stanley. Yes. And I'm forgetting someone. Damn it. No, that, I, that's it. Because the two were together. Exactly. Right. Yep. And Stephen Halliday after he wins the Jonathan Peacher Award at Dev Camp, because that's his to lose, man. We only saw half an hour, but that was his to lose. This guy is dominating out there. Yeah, and he looked pretty good on the football field as well, eh? The boys were out with the Red Blacks doing drills. Tyler Tyler Boucher was kind of commanding things, uh, kicking field goals, catching passes. So, although there was a couple times, Ross, where uh, Boucher tackled uh, the pads and fell down. I was like, ooh, watch the yep. shoulder. Watch the yeah. shoulder. Yeah, come on. Not clear for contact yet. Boosh, yeah. take it easy. But that guy's got good <laughs> speed and it's it's full throttle oh, for yeah. sure. So, no, great to see. And if people are asking our quick opinions on Dev Camp, we, we covered it a little bit more uh, on Tuesday's show, the day after we went to Dev Camp. But Stephen Halliday and Tyler Boucher, to me, stood out above all else when it came Absolutely. to boards. Tyler Clevin on the back end just looks like a man amongst boys. And Philip Norberg looked pretty good out there, too. 
yeah, passing, I think, needs a little work for Nordberg. But, uh, man, this guy's hands are a lot better than I thought. Did the old Forsberg. Nope, we're going to pull it back to the forehand and do that. So, uh, no, really cool and great to see all the, the Sens prospects getting together at uh, at the football field. I think some of the Red Blacks came out and yep. uh, put them through some drills as well. So that video is available on the Senators' social content. Pilsy, I really don't want to talk about Alex Dabrinkit, but I feel like just like we had to do with ownership, the update is there is no update, but great. it's pretty much, I think, Anaheim, Detroit. They just seem like the natural fits here for him, where one's a young and up-and-coming team where he can be that first-line star and make the most money on the team and, and do all that and be in a very comfortable area in Newport Beach, or you go to the hometown team in Detroit. Like To me, it's kind of those two teams that uh, we're going to have to focus in on. It seems to make the most sense, like trade wise, right? Uh, now, Ian Mendez put out an article in the Athletic Ross talking about trading within the division. So I'll pose this question to you Do you have any preference, whether it's Anaheim and Detroit, based on the fact that Detroit's in the division? Does that no. matter to you? No, don't care. No, Honestly, don't care. Detroit's biggest problem is that they're soft. And I don't think I, I know that Debrinka, we saw him fight Joel Faraby. I'm not saying Debrinka's soft. You, that was impressive. You got to give it to him there. Definitely, and I'm giving them his credit, but they have so many other needs. That that might not be a fit. <laughs> hey, little Pierre Maguire. Famous last words. Hey, little Pierre Maguire for the people. Uh, that was Kerry Price, by the way, that got drafted uh, there. I think it worked out okay. <laughs> oh, man, that's a ricochet shot to Pierre. Sorry about that. But, um, no, in all seriousness, um, no, doesn't bother me. I think that you're probably looking – well, you're looking at a team with two first-rounders next year. I don't think you can get both. No. But it'd be pretty cool if you could. Definitely. Definitely <laughs> cool. Yeah. For for me, it like obviously it's it's not ideal to trade a guy like to bring it in the division, but at in no way is that a deal breaker or does that shift my mindset. But as I'm, long as it's not a goalie, because we saw I we've been beating oh no, like yeah. Robin Leonard in Buffalo beat the head. Pull up the stat. <laughs> oh no, no the graphic. And then Ben Bishop in Tampa. Yeah, we don't need another goalie like that in the division. Even Craig Anderson with Buffalo all these years later. But, uh, yeah, for a player, like, I don't know, man. And people are asking still the question, are you going to boo him? And it's like, yeah, but I don't hate him at all. Like, what are we supposed to do? Like, like put our arm around him when he comes in playing with the Red Wings? Here's where I stand. I'll, I'll boo him when he's announced. But I'm not doing that every time he touches the puck, boo. I'm, I'm not Well, doing he's that. more of an on the stick, off the stick. You didn't really carry the puck that much that he lost yeah, here. Every time he hits the post and miss, misses a wide open net, I won't boo him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as like the options between Anaheim and Detroit, I feel like Anaheim is a better trade partner just, just because they have better assets, in my opinion. And I think it would make more sense for it to bring it to go there because like, like you mentioned, he's – immediately the top guy he's going to get to play with up and coming uh players like they, they have the space to big, hand out a big contract that he's looking for so personally i would hope that he would go to anheim but that would be hilarious though um you know we, the sends traded for bobby ryan like their elite sniper yeah. and then now they're sending to bring it back over there wow that is actually interesting and bobby was a a four time 30 goal scorer and to bring it to two time 40 goal scorer. So no, it, there are some, some interesting parallels there. So you're saying that we're going to get Silverberg. We're going to get Stefan Nason. We're going to get a first round pick that ends up being 10th overall. That'd be cool. I mean, honestly, a, a trade like that structure would be good. I would, I'd be down for that. Yeah. Uh, I, it's always interesting to remember. And I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two years later. Yes. We know what happened, but Anaheim was pushing for Zabanajad in that trade for Bobby Ryan. They end up settling for Silverberg instead. I mean, he's had a long career there. There's no doubt. But um, at the same time, yeah, Ottawa did well by holding on to, to Zibanejad for a little bit longer. Just um, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's still tough to, to think back at. But, no, in all in all seriousness, uh, Anaheim – I mean, Anaheim and Ottawa could have two of the best center depths in the league right now – or in the next five years where it's like right now Anaheim's like Zegris, McTavish uh, – Leo Carlson, who they just drafted uh, yep. second overall. So I think if you're if you're Alex Dabrinkit, how do you not look at that and be like, hey, if I'm signing an eight-year deal like this, I could grow with this team pretty good here. I didn't even mention Nathan Gauthier, who just won the Memorial Cup with Quebec Rampart. Who, who, 
yeah, they've, they've got a lot of talent coming up and a new GM who just started before the 2022 draft. Okay. I'm not saying McTavish is on the table. He's in all likelihood untouchable, <laughs> but I don't think Pat Verbeek would have any loyalty to anyone outside of just one draft class. When you look at their big prospect pool, like a Tristan Luno on defense or that sort of thing. So I think it would be built around futures. I, I mentioned Troy Terry's name yesterday, but I don't think that's realistic. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. But they got a lot of assets. Yeah. And Ross, if I'm the Ducks, I'm looking at this like, yeah, you just had another big draft pick. You've got all this excitement. You've been rebuilding for a couple of years and you're bringing in a new jersey too. Why not bring in a top sniper to get the people excited? Like the Alex to bring it, uh, purple ducks jerseys would fly off the shelf so that's a that's a little sales pitch for the ducks here yeah size small for sure uh <laughs> elliot friedman on nhl network as well saying that the sends and wings are actively working on it to bring a trade he wants to play for detroit yeah he also mentions zadina being placed on waivers by the way he cleared waivers yeah uh, that's gives crazy. detroit more room to work on a to bring it deal it seems like they're going to just like terminate his contract. Uh, unconditional waivers, I believe it's called. Friedman doesn't think the trade is that far away. The last hurdle is the toughest. And we know the streets are telling Aleem's Martian that look out for the next 24 to 48 hours. And I think just for peace of mind's sake or Pierre's mind's sake, maybe I can pl play a little riff on that because he needs to figure out $9 million dollars right the qualifying or we know they, they can push back arbitration yada 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 Sens have 9.2 million dollars to work with right now and shane pinto is a pretty important part of the future and you really should get some clarity on what's going on sooner rather than later by the way happy birthday pierre dorian i'm sure he's working on a, oh, nice. a trade, trade here uh on his birthday but uh when you look at, at how things are going to shake out whatever it is just get the best package and if you even have to just settle for futures and then flip the futures yeah. Then just do that. Yeah, I, I'm okay with that uh, route, Ross. I think I think the thing is, and they talked about this on 32 Thoughts, is there's two pieces to this, right? Dorian can make the trade. He can't work on the extension. Uh, Jeff Jackson can work on the extension. He can't make the trade. So th eventually these two parties are going to have to come together and compromise if they're going to get something done. Like I'm not so convinced, Ross, that the trade is the issue. I... I'm of the mind and I have no sources. I have no reports of this. This is just my feelings. Um, I'm of the mind that the Sens and Wings probably have a deal in place. Maybe not finalized, but they've got something that both teams like. But the thing is, Stevie Y, it, it took him forever just to lock up his captain long term. And so I don't think Stevie Y is uh, too, um, too quick to just hand out a long term extension to Brinkin. And I think that's what's holding this up. My final thoughts on today's show is going to be a mock trade, Pilsy. Sue me. But, <laughs> Sick. You know, well, we just talked, and I don't think this is that unrealistic, okay. but we just talked about the, the Bobby Ryan trade. And yes, I know times are different, 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 different. Yes, okay. How about this as framework? Dominic Kubalik, mm -hmm. young roster player, probably, like better, probably better than a lot of people give him credit for. Yep. Philip Zadina. Would be the Stefan Nason, right? A first round pick who really just hasn't panned out. But wait, can I ask, is that going to be a contract terminated, Philip Sedina, or on his contract now? Well, I guess if it's terminated, then he's a free agent. So maybe that's maybe that's not the guy. But an, let's say a, a 22 to 24 year old who maybe doesn't excite you that much. Okay. <laughs> Philip Sedina, yeah. And a first round pick. And you hope it. You hope it's Detroit's first round pick, not Boston's. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I think that's that's fine. Honestly, this point, like, like, yeah. Imagine being a GM with negotiations because we're just sick of it. We're like, yeah, sure, just, just give me whatever. Do it. Yeah, just like we we have to move on here. So yes, yeah. Ross, <laughs> that's the greatest mock trade I've ever seen. Get it done. Let us know in the comments. You like my mock trade or what? But yo, Kubalik would actually be like a a great middle six option for the Sens. Yeah, well, he, he would be that line driving third, third line guy. You talked about in previous episodes. He's making 2.5 his final year of his contract, but he's making 2.5 by the way, led all of the world championships in goals, eight goals in eight games Had 20 goals, 45 points last year in 81 games with the Detroit Red Wings. So is that the kind of guy that you yeah. want on the squad? Yep. I don't know, but I think if he's in the deal, I, that's a decent roster player to get back. 
And then it's about getting the best prospects. Everyone wants to go with Jonathan Ber- Bergren, and, and he's unreal. But is he a guy who's even going to be available? Who knows? But we'll have all that when and if it does happen. Sounds like it's not far. Yep. Sounds like it's not far, Pilsy. I don't know what we're going to latch on to to be the next long, drawn-out process for the Ottawa Senators after the sale and after the Debrinket. Maybe we'll actually have to get excited for next season because this team's better than it is last year without any exactly. Debrinket news because you got a year older Jake Sanderson. You've got uh, reinforcements coming in. I'm very excited about the upcoming season, and we want you to follow with us the entire way you can follow the show on twitter at send central instagram locked on dot senators pillsy i gave my final thoughts now what are yours uh you know what i'm i'm just gonna leave it here i don't i don't have anything we've already kind of dove into anything so uh, final thoughts for me no it's final been, thoughts been a busy week eh in ottawa yeah, it really has it really has it was an absolute blast though yes and we'll be able to provide you all with that great content over the next couple of weeks but for today we say goodbye for brandon pillar I'm Ross Levitan, and this has been the Locked On Senators Podcast. It's your team every day.